Right, what we have here is the Pioneer Ultralight. It's an absolute legend of a bivvy, and the mainstay of anglers are like extreme rigidity and mobility. Right, to set it up, first of all, you take it out of the little bag it comes in, take it out, get the ground sheet out and your space. Once you've got the ground sheet all flat, you'll know where it'll go. So then once you do, pull out the ribs, make sure they're not caught around each other, and then you grab the two arms that are on the back, pull it together gently, make sure the ribs aren't caught on each other, and once they come together, the little new clip goes straight on the top like that. Right, what can I say about this bivvy? It's made out of the Aquatex material, which is probably the best bivvy material there is. It comes with lovely features, including the mesh grill here. Um, takes four poles. These are the quick sticks that we have on here at the moment. Comes with the heavy duty pegs, not the cheap tent pegs that you see come on most bivvy, proper bivvy pegs, proper nice ones. Multiple pegging points for different heights, for different conditions. Um, as you can see, I've got the front rolled up here. What else can I say about it? It comes with the storm caps, these lovely stainless storm caps. Usually on bivvies you have to buy these as extras. You've got four of them. Right, this is the bivvy as you see it now. You can get an add-on, which is a, a winter skin. It doesn't come all the way round, it comes sort of three quarters of the way round. What that does is eliminate any condensation and just keep you a little bit more toasty in the winter. And if you're an angler like me that likes to keep mobile, likes to keep his gear light, easy to set up, then I couldn't recommend this bivvy highly enough. We're going to talk on the bank luxuries now and when Tracker asked me to field test the new Armo Life Kettle I didn't think it was going to take another van to get it over here. Seriously it's not quite as big as it looks in the picture but it will still take six cups of tea at once so more than enough to keep any tea monsters at bay. There's a nice little neoprene pouch for putting your gas bottles in as well to keep them nice and warm in the winter and that's sitting on the new power stove which folds away to absolutely nothing and boils a kettle in no time at all and they've got those lovely green mugs as well which are super lightweight but metal so they're not going to spoil. And this is the new 13 litre cool box from Tracker. Takes up to nine key of boiler, it's another kilo of cell going in there. A nice green carpy colour. Obviously you could use it for bait, but you could use it for your food as well. And there's three new chairs in the range, all extremely comfortable. A nice carpy green colour, plus a bed chair buddy as well. So lots of new gadgets from Tracker that are going to make you stay on the bank, just that little bit more luxurious. They don't come much better than this, do they? 42 pounds of immaculate, gigantic a common. Well worth the wait, it's been a slow week for me. And uh, this fella came along on a penultimate night and just couldn't expect anything better than that. Really, really pleased. Got the wind right in my face. It's blowing a bit of a hooligan in here now. 10 pound subline. I'm getting out about 125 yards, Diver tournament leader, punching it straight out into the wind. And this fella was out there waiting. Hopefully there's some more out there, but I don't really care too much now. Blown away. Okay, well it's been a quiet week for me. The fish haven't been up this end of the lake at all, but this morning I was fortunate enough to catch a very, very special fish indeed. Uh, it's one that we think may only have been caught once before or not at all. A really, really rare virgin common carp, 42 pound, absolute stunner. And this is the rig that I used to catch that fish. Unlike some of the other guys that have opted for the boily approach, I've gone solely for the nut bait. And um, quite often, if you fish this kind of rig, this kind of bait, you will find you single out those big elusive fish particularly commons. Um, so I'm going to take you through the, the setup that I've got tied here. Starting off at the sharp end, I've got of course a wide gate barbless captor in a size 6. That's gravel coloured, I'm fishing over a clay coloured bottom out there so the gravel is toning in nicely. I've got that tied on, whipped with just a standard knotless knot style to probably a 10 inch length of the new end trap coated material. And what I've done is before I've started to tie that, I've stripped away the last three inches and then tied a small loop in the end of the section. I've then slid a piece of silicon tubing on, which is going to trap the hair against the shank once we finish tying. And then I've whipped it using a five turn knotless knot back out through the front of the eye. And then with the very small piece of coated section that I had left, I've pushed that back to create a ruffled up uh, textured surface onto which to mould a blob 
of the dark matter tungsten putty. And you'll know any of you guys who've seen me do my rigs things before, I always have a lump of putty on my rigs, bottom baits or pop-ups. That is the essential element in my opinion. So coming up to the hook bait, a Brazil nut. What we've done is um, drilled that out uh, using a six mil nut drill and inserted a cork plug. That has then been trimmed off and slid onto the hair so that uh, I fish it the opposite way to Tom. I like the buoyant end to be at the top end of the bait. But basically what I need to do is balance it so that the hook sits flat and the bait just hovers above it like so. That's quite important. You don't want it lifting the hook and you don't want it twisting the hook around in the wrong fashion. The hook needs to be flat on the deck for this, in my opinion. So the bit of silicon traps the hair roughly opposite the hook point. Then coming back, as I said, we've got about an inch, inch and a half of uncoated supple section of end trap leading into the big dollop of dark matter putty. And then the continuation of the hook link is coated end trap all the way through to the ring swivel, which is fitted into the hybrid clip. This is one of the uh, safe zone leaders which comes ready assembled with the hybrid leg clip. I favour this system particularly because the lead will come off every time that it hits something. It's a very, very soft plastic, more than capable of withstanding even heavy leads being cast. Um, but this is soft enough so that with very light pressure, the lead will come off straight away. Fishing for big fish, you know, where you've got weedy water, as I have in this bay, very important to drop that lead. So that's the setup, hybrid lead clip, safe zone leader, two ounce lead, 10 inch hook link, and a Brazil nut hook bait. Yet another gigantic carp seduced by the smell of the main line. This one taken on the new Grange, but on a special hook bait that I've actually made on the bank. So we're gonna get this fella back and show you those hook baits. Taking that little bit of extra time to make your own special hook baits will put loads more fish in your landing net. The first ones here are very simple to do. You buy the mainline paste in the pot, in the freezer section in your local tackle shop, and all you're doing is moulding paste around a cork ball. But the trick is, with these ones, I'm putting just enough paste so they only just float. So rather than drilling the bait out like Tom does and putting the cork plug in it, I don't like that so much because you can still see the bit of cork. Here, the cork ball's completely inside them. Now these bigger ones are probably 22 mil. They've got a 12 mil cork ball inside them. The small ones are probably 15, 16 mil, and they've got a 10 mil cork ball inside them. And basically you just mold the paste around the cork ball, roll them round, drop them in a thing of water before you boil them and see how much they float. You might put too much paste on and they might sink. Pinch a bit off, roll them again until they're just coming up to the top. And that means when you attach those to a hook, the bait's going to be floating, but the hook's going to be laying flat on the bottom. And if you find that it's floating up too much and the hook's actually up off the bottom and the hair's extended, which I don't like if I'm fishing over bottom, loads of bottom baits, then what I would do is put a small split shot underneath the bait on the hair and that just holds it down so the hook's laying flat on the bottom and the bait is just hovering just above. So when the fish sucks it in, whack it goes back. And if you've got the KD rig on, the, the hook and the bait are really separate. The hook catches hold. Oh, Little bleepage on the left hand rod. I think the fish are back in the area. So that separation between the bait and hook helps the hook catch hold and bang, you've got him. Now these I'd probably dry out for four or five days before I'm gonna freeze them. They'll go harder and harder and they will get lighter and lighter. So you'll find when you first put them in the water, they're a little bit too light. You may need a split shot on them and over time they'll take a little bit of extra water on. But the good thing about a cork ball, they don't take too much water on because there's only a thin skin of boily and loads of cork balls, so the buoyancy doesn't change that much. So that's the easiest one. Let's show you the next step on. Now, these little beauties are a little bit more involved, but well worth the extra effort. It's still the new Grange mix, just the same as the cork balls I just showed you, but this is a combination of base mixes. So it's the Polaris pop-up mix in two thirds, and then one third bottom bait Grange mix, and that forms a nice slow sinker. So those bigger baits there are gonna sink just with the weight of the hook. Some may need a little tiny shot on them, but they're almost perfect. So to make the mix, just crack an egg into a mixing bowl, 15 mil of new Grange activator, which is more than you'd put in a bottom bait mix, but because the fish are never eating these, you can't really overdo the attractors. And then I'm just adding that mix that I've already blended. So one cup 
of New Grange bottom bait mix, two cups of pop-up mix is just about right for a slow sinker. So I'm just adding that, forming a sticky mess, adding a bit more, adding a bit more until it goes to a nice soft dough that's not really too sticky on your fingers. And then literally you just roll them into balls. Now the bigger ones are for fishing over the top of the baits I'm putting out here, the New Grange and the cell. So they're about the same size as those. And then the smaller ones I've moulded round a cork ball. They're moulded round a size 10 mil cork ball and that's for fishing the chod rig when I'm fishing back in the UK at Wellington and places like that. You need something with a cork ball inside it to hold that chod rig up off the bottom all the time because these mixes will take water on and that means overnight the pop-up can lose its buoyancy and then the chod rig doesn't work as well. I'm boiling them for about two minutes to get them nice and hard and then I'm drying them out for probably four or five days and then I'll put some more new Grange activator onto the baits and just let them soak in and over a couple of days all that will soak up, put a little bit more in, you don't want them swimming but just glassy on the outside and then they'll draw that back into them so when they're out in the water you're just getting bursts of attraction coming out of it where that new Grange activator is just coming out of it out of it and the colour because they're a little bit lighter than the other baits they almost look washed out so from the fish's point of view I don't think there's going to be any resistance to these they're only going to get you a quicker bite and finally these little beauties are absolute gold dust proper tangy fruity lovely goodness now these ones are molded around a cork ball and then I've also got ones that are just straight Polaris pop-up mix. This is 100% pop-up mix, so very, very buoyant pop-ups anyway, but if you're going to use that chod rig, you need them around a cork ball. So to make them, very, very simplistic. You don't need a lot of kit with you if you're making them on the bank. I never make my pop-ups indoors. I always take it with me. At the end of the day, you're sitting there for long periods doing nothing. You might as well be making some hook baits. And one batch, well, how many fish is that? Probably 50, 60 baits in there. That's 50, 60 carp. Well worth the effort. So crack an egg into a bowl. Then goes your mix of flavours. These ones are a blend of raspberry ripple and pineapple, two brilliant flavours on their own but blended together even better. And with those I put some sweet aid. So I've got about into a bottle probably 40 mil of combined flavours, 20 mil of each, and then I've got about 15 mil of the sweet aid and that just rounds it off and stops it tasting too bitter. And then whatever I end up with in that mix, I add the same amount of multi stim. And that's an appetite stimulator so it's going to make the fish want to feed and that just adds to the attraction. And it's such a good product, you can't overdo it. So I mix all that up into a bottle, shake it up, and then 20 mil of that goes into one egg, which may sound excessive, but again, the fish are not eating them, so it doesn't really matter how much you put in. So once all that's in there, I'll add some yellow dye in this case. You can not put any dye in at all if you want. It comes out a nice sort of creamy colour, which is a real good colour, or you can do them whatever colour you want. Then I'm just adding neat Polaris mix a little bit at a time so you get a sticky mess and then it'll go up to sort of a doughy mixture. And then once it doesn't stick on your hands anymore, then that's about right. And what I do is put it into a plastic bag and leave it for about an hour. And what happens then, all the moisture that's in it draws right through it and it's a much nicer mix to work with because if you're trying to roll it around a cork ball, it can be really difficult. If it's too dry, it's too crumbly, it'll just keep coming off the cork ball. So obviously I keep these separate, don't want to get them mixed up because the buoyancy is completely different. So I'll leave them on a little bit of kitchen roll, that's all you need to take with you, just on top of a bucket lid that you'd normally take with your fishing. Just roll them out and then boil them for about 90 seconds, obviously boiling them separate so they don't get mixed up and then you dry them for three or four days and then the same thing shake up your flavor bottle that you've done your mix in and just add a little bit to it let them soak it up over a couple of days keep doing that three or four times and they are absolutely perfect and in there is probably 50 very big carp and if you really can't be bothered then these little fellas can be doused up as well. These are the mainline pop-ups, straight out of the range. This is the pineapple, a legendary bait, but if you put one of those mixes on top of it, it just smells even more pungent and it's gonna get you even more bites. And mainline have improved all their pop-ups. They're a lot more buoyant, the flavors are even stronger, and they're gonna catch you loads of carp. Well, another hard fighting gigantic mirror carp, getting close to the net now. And whether you're gonna make your own hook baits, or to use them straight out of the bag, you can have complete confidence that if you've got feeding fish on you, you're going to catch them on mainline. Come on, you beauty. Come on. Come on. Yes. Got him. Another one on the mainline. What an absolute stunner.
They don't get much better looking than this one. Just over 24 pounds taken on the Grange, as all the fish have been taken on the Grange in this session. Fished at 110 yards with the old faithful infinities. Wicked. Well, welcome to Wellington Country Park. Um, no sooner have I cast out the famous chod rig and we are away. Probably the fastest bite I've ever had on here. They haven't even got any of the other rods out yet. And uh, it looks like a bionic ghosty. Oh no, no I'm wrong, it uh, looks like a, I think it might be a mirror. Um, and the chod rig is perfect for places like Wellington because there's weed absolutely everywhere. And I've just noticed fish crashing out at range so I've whacked a rod out onto them and uh, it's gone straight away and that's the beauty of the chod rig you can cast it onto virtually anything and uh, it's still presenting the bait come on Right under my feet there. Come on, in the net you go. Got him! Come on! What a start, wicked. And there he is, an absolutely stunning welly mirror. 29 pounds, you can see this one's got a little bit of ghost in him because he's quite light in colour and his fins are very light. They always fight like demons, these ones. Well chuffed to get him. It just shows you how effective the Johnny can be when you're casting the chain fish. So let's get this one back and show you how to tie it. This is the infamous chod rig, very, very fashionable at the moment and uh, deadly in certain situations, not brilliant in others and we'll talk about that later on. But first of all, to talk about how to tie it because that is very important to get it just right. The material I'm using for the hook link is called mouth trap. It's a very, very stiff mono. It's got a green tint in it, which makes it very, very difficult to see in water. Because it's a lot stiffer than other hook links, you will struggle to start off with, but after a bit of practice, it is easy to tie. So I'm using a size 11 ring swivel there, keeping everything small and neat. And then I've tied a simple overhand loop knot into that, the same lot that you'd use at the end of your hair rig. That's tied on. Doesn't look very nice to start off with, but once you've steamed it, it'll go nice and round like that. So after that, I'll tie on a size six choddy hook in this situation. I'm fishing for big fish here at long range, so I'm using a decent size hook. And before I tie that choddy hook on, I'll always test the point and make sure it's super, super sharp. So to tie the hook on, you could use the knotless knot and tie the rig round the other way by tying the hook on first. Personally, I use a whipping knot and it means I can get the rig as short as that. So I tie the, the overhand loop knot first, then the line goes through the eye of the hook towards the back of the hook and then I pull that down so there's probably only a centimetre between the loop and the hook because when you tighten the knot everything's going to extend a little bit and then I do a big loop underneath the hook and with the front of the loop I wrap around the hook once going up towards the bend and then I wrap around again but crossing over that first turn going back down towards the eye and I'll probably use between five and seven turns on a chod rig to get the, the knot just the right length so everything sits perfect. Then to tighten the knot, I'll just pull the very short tag end at the front and that tightens the loop at the back. Pull it really, really tight and then wet it with saliva and pull it down next to the eye of the hook. So you've all got, already got the line going through the eye the right way, so the hook's always going to flip into the fish's mouth. The knot is tied perfectly and then we need to form our loop 
on the back of the hook, the D if you like. So I put on a small size rig ring and then poke the tag end of that D back through the eye of the hook, cut it off very short and then very carefully I burn it, pulling all the hook link out of the way so I can't melt the hook link and I just burn that tag end, it blobs up and it won't pull back through and that's what forms our D. And then before I tie the bait on, I would steam this to get it looking lovely. When you first tie it, it doesn't look very nice at all, but over the steam, I'll put a pen or something like that into that loop and just stretch it so it's nice and round, steam that, and then I'll get the hook link, wrap it round a rig cone and steam it as well to get that lovely curve in it. You can shape the mouth trap with your fingers if you can't use steam when you're fishing, but I prefer to steam it because you get the same curve every single time. And then next we tie the bait on and the buoyancy of the bait is absolutely critical. It must be super, super buoyant. This particular one has got a 10mm cork ball inside it and this is the paste that I made at Gigantica. So it's a slow sinking paste wrapped around that cork ball so it's extremely buoyant and that will hold up nice and straight off the lead coil when it's in the water. So I'll get some bait floss, tie a simple slip knot which is making a loop and then another one behind it, passing the tag end through the two. And then that's tightened around the widest part of the bait. It's very important to get it there so it doesn't slip off when you cast. Then I tie it to the rig ring with a granny knot. So basically one knot locks the previous one in place. So I'll do three or four knots, pull them really, really tight and then cut the tag ends nice and short. And you can burn them as well if it's not too windy. I haven't done on this occasion and I haven't found it to be any particular problem. And then that is the chod rig done. And basically when we cast out, what's going to happen is that rig is going to slide up against the top bead there. So the rig itself is probably going to be, in this case, two and a half feet away from the lead, and it's just going to come to settle on the bottom like that. So it's that far away from it. So that's an advantage straight away. You're not close to the lead, so the fish is not seeing that. And then you've got that bait very easily rotating on that light bit of lead core. If you fish this system on a slack line, I think what actually happens is the lead core actually lifts as the fish sucks the bait in, the bait goes a long way back in its mouth, it's on a very short, very stiff hook link, and you've got it. That fish is nailed to the deck, and there's no way it can get away. So, choddies are very important to be sliding back up the line. You don't want them down by the lead, and it's important to get your lead core system right. So, to talk to you about the lead core, first of all, you can see very, very supple lead core. This is a new product from Calder called Cable. Excellent camouflage very very supple very hard wearing as well we've worked for a long time on this to get it absolutely right and i've been field testing this all year and i've had quite a lot of big fish on it 640s out of this lake in the spring plus a load of 30s as well so we've really put this stuff through its paces so when you're making a lead core leader first of all you need to splice either end so you take out about two inches of lead then you put a, a tiny little thin needle through the side of the lead core up inside the lead core for about an inch and then out the side and then pull the tag end back through. That forms your splice and then just cut the tag end of the splice off and pull it back up inside the lead core so that splice is perfectly smooth. So if the line unfortunately snaps, everything can get off the end of the lead core and the fish can get away from it. That is, that is absolutely critical. I've seen people splicing lead core and leaving the tag end out the side, even blobbing it. You've got a great big lump on the end of the lead core and there's no way the fish is gonna get away from it. So once you've spliced it, there's no way that can come undone if you pull it in a straight line. The tighter you pull it, the stronger it gets. And this stuff actually breaks at 60 pound breaking strain. Even though it's quite thin, with a splice, it's got a very, very high breaking strain. So to stop it from undoing it when it's slack and you're tying the mono on and off of it, I just put a little dab of super glue at the bottom of the splice. That just holds it all in place. It's not for strength. That comes from the splice itself, but it just keeps it nice and hard wearing. And I'll splice the loop at either end. And at the lead end, you can see I've got quite a few different bits there. I've got a five mil rubber bead from the safe zone range that's punctured through the side so it doesn't slide up and down the lead core. That's on there quite tight. You can do it at that end, but you should never puncture those beads at the other end, and I'll show you why in a minute. Then I've got a short length of one mil silicon tube, and that basically just acts as a shock absorber. So if I bring the hook link down to it and pull against it, can you see that's bunching up there? And it's basically stopping the lead from ending up really close to the fish's face and smashing it around in the face. So next to our bit of one mil silicon, I've got a helicopter sleeve there to neaten everything up. And if I just pull that apart, you can see I've got a quick link on the end of that leader and then a lead without the swivel on, on that quick link. And that stops it from moving around in the air and just keeps everything nice and neat. 
And lead size is really important on this rig as well. I use the lightest lead I can possibly get away with. In this situation here, I'm fishing 120, 130 yards out, so I'm using a three and a half ounce distance lead. I've had two 40s out of this swim, fishing at about 40 yards, just off to the right over there. I was using a two ounce lead in that situation. So swap the lead around, use the lightest one you can, and there's less chance of it getting caught in any weed or anything. It's important when you're playing fish on this rig, Get that line tight as quickly as you can, get the rod up in the air, especially if it's weedy, and try and keep that fish on the surface as much as you can. I don't have the clutch loose, it's all done up tight, so as soon as that bobbin pulls up to the top and unclips itself, I'm into the fish and I'm getting it out of the weed as quickly as possible. And if you find when you're playing the fish, it weeds you up straight away, as sometimes it does on these particular places, just be patient. Point the rod at the fish, loosen the clutch off, and the fish will eventually start to take line and move out of the weed. You can then wind down, pull the line out of the weed, and get it back in. And sometimes you might have to do that three or four times before you actually get the fish out of the weed. And then moving down to the other end, we need to talk rig safety because that is extremely important. On there, we've got a bit of clear rubber tubing but it's not rubber tubing that's very soft, so it won't bunch up, it's quite tough. You pull it on there with a splicing needle to actually get it onto the leg core in the first place, and you will have to wet the leg core to get it down there. Once it's in place, that doesn't move. You can slide it up and down yourself if you want to change the position, but it won't move on the cast or anything like that. And that bead, that five mil bead that we punctured at the other end, that just semi-fixes on there under the lightest amount of tension. So if we do lose the fish, the line unfortunately breaks, then that will pull off of there and then off the end of the leader. And the test to use in this situation, wet the whole thing because you're going to obviously be using it wet, and then hold the hook link and shake the lead. And if you can shake the hook link off of the leader by using the weight of the lead, then the fish can do the same thing. I see people a lot of time puncturing beads, God, that looks sharp, puncturing beads and putting them on the leg core like that and basically the punctured bead would end up getting to that splice or getting to the needle knot if that's what you're using and it will stick there because it's too tight a grip so by doing it this way because you've got a wider bore with that little bit of silicon when the bead slides off it slides very easily there because it's a bigger bore and then it will go over the top of that splice and off the end really easily so I'd never ever puncture a bead and put it on the leg core or have a very tight bead on the leg core. You have to be a soft rubber bead like this 5mm one and make sure that it's mounted onto a bit of silicon tube like that and then the rig is safe. That's extremely important. It's something I see a lot of people do wrong. And then looking at the length of the leg core leader, here I'm using a metre because that's the rule at this particular lake and I think that's a sound rule. There's a fashion at the moment for using two, three, four, five meters of lead core over a rod length of lead core very very difficult to cast i've seen people crack off a lot with it and leave a live rig out in the lake and i can't see the advantage of it if your rig's 10 or 12 feet away from the lead and you're feeling the lead down on the bottom how can you possibly know what the hook link's landing on so it's a fashionable thing i don't think it offers any advantage and if you think if you've got 10 or 12 feet of lead core on and you're playing a fish and then the line snaps that hook link has got to get up 10 or 12 feet of lead core to get off the end. And if the lead core is concertinaed up, a bit of lead stuck out the side or there's a bit of weed on it, that may not get off the end. So I think a metre, metre and a half at most, you're never going to fish in weed any deeper than that. I think any longer than that is completely unnecessary. The cable lead core comes in one breaking strain, 50 pound, and in two different colour combinations. This is the dark one for weed and silt, and there's a gravel version as well. And what we've done there is broken up the straight line by flecking the colour down it, so the fish find it harder to see. You can buy it in a bulk spool or in ready tied leaders, and there'll be a metre log. So there'll be a version like this for chod rigs, and there's also a ring swivel version for fishing with lead clips or running rigs. So as I said at the start, it's not the be all and end all. It does suit these particular type of waters in this baiting situation where you're doing a big spread of boilies. But if you're fishing really tight and you're spotting, I wouldn't have a chod rig on. I'd have a normal rig on and a little PVA stick. And if everybody uses them, they do get overfished just like anything else and the fish do wise up to them. So, so this is a rig 
that Adam's explained to me how to tie, and I love the way this sits in the water. It's effectively a chod rig on the end, but we've got a stiff boom section. In this case, I've used a 20 pound mouth trap, which is really stiff and pushes it a long way away from the leader. You can use 20 pound IQ too, or even men trap soft if you wanted to. If it's very weedy out there and you want that boom to rest in the weed, then that's probably a better option. But if I'm fishing over just light silk weed or even over gravel or silt, then I'll use a stiff boom like that. And basically, it will sit like that on the bottom. Obviously, it will be away from the lead because when we cast, it will fly back up the line exactly like a normal chod rig. But you've got that boom section there, so everything moves a little bit more easily. You've still got the nice curved bit by the hook, just as we have with a normal chod rig, so it'll always spin and go into the fish's mouth when it takes it in. But you've got that boom section, and you can put putty onto the boom so it only just sinks and it gives everything a little bit more movement because what people reckon happens is when the fish get hammered on chod rigs, they just tentatively suck at the bait because they know they're gonna get nailed on it and it doesn't even get in their mouth. So if you put a boom section on, it moves just that little bit more, it's in their mouth, flips and catches hold, and you've got them again. So if you're gonna fish over a spread of boilies or you've got weed on the bottom or you're casting it showing fish, that's what I recommend. If you've ever had your fishing tackle stolen, as I have a couple of times, you'll know exactly how it feels. You're sick to your stomach, um, and the first thing you think of is, how am I possibly gonna go fishing again? I had it stolen out of my container at work. They took absolutely everything, 16 rods, 16 reels, everything I owned was gone and it took me a long time to replace it all and it got taken from my van as well um, and the same thing took a long time to replace and on both occasions it wasn't covered by my house insurance so if nothing else check out your house insurance policy and make sure that your tackle is covered to the level you think it is and if it isn't then why not check out this new policy that we're doing called Call to Cover. We've teamed up with a company that specialise in bespoke insurance and they've already got over 50,000 golfers covered by their policies. So let's have a look at the fish and tackle policy and see what it covers. So first of all and most importantly, the theft of your tackle. Now I've looked around my swim and valued what I take fishing with me each time I go and it comes out to over nine grand which I was really surprised about. We canvassed the boys at work as well and the average for them was about seven and a half thousand so most people are taking a lot more with them than they really expect. There are five different levels of cover so let's have a look at the seven and a half thousand pound level because from our research that's the most common value of tackle that people have got. So if the whole lot got stolen from your house, your garage or your place of work, you're covered up to the full amount of £7,500. Obviously all these places have to be locked and you must report the theft to the police and get a crime number and make your claim to us within 30 days of the theft. Believe it or not, it's even covered in your lock garden shed but only up to a value of £2,000 because a shed's nowhere near as secure as a house or garage. It's still covered if it's stolen from a locked vehicle, even if it's on view, right up to the full amount of £7,500, even if it's not your car. But if it's stolen between 8 o'clock at night and 8 o'clock in the morning, the excess goes up from £50 to £500. And sadly, nowadays, theft does happen on the bank, and if you're unlucky enough to be challenged, rather than risk getting hurt defending your kit, if you've got the policy in place, it's better to just let them take it and replace it through the insurance. And because we've been able to design this policy specifically for anglers, your gear's even covered when you're asleep at the lake. So if all your rods and reels get stolen while you're on the bank and you're asleep in the bivvy, you're going to be covered. And this isn't just when you're fishing in the UK, it covers you worldwide, excluding the USA and Canada. So if you're on holiday in France, for example, and all your gear gets taken, you're still covered. The things you're not covered for is if you leave the tackle unattended and then it goes missing. So if you leave the lake to go to the shops or if you leave the lake to go for a curry or something, come back to find it all gone. You're not going to be covered for that because we consider that negligent. Your tackle is also covered for accidental damage. So if a rod gets trodden on or slammed in a car door or snapped when you're casting, it will be covered, but you're going to have to pay an excess of £50. We're not just covering your tackle, we're covering you as well. So you get public liability on this policy and personal accident. And for full terms and conditions, check out the website. This policy also covers your syndicate fees. So if you suffer an accident or illness while you're fishing and you can't fish for 50 days or more, some of your syndicate fees will be reimbursed by the policy. It's amazing how much bait we keep in our freezers nowadays. And if your freezer accidentally goes down, you're gonna be covered on this policy up to 200 pounds worth of boilies. And as a special incentive for all policyholders, we're going to pay out £1,000 if you catch a record freshwater fish. 
This must, of course, be verified by the British Records Rod Court Fish Committee. A very important point for all policyholders is that we aim to settle all legitimate claims within seven days of receiving them, and no proof of purchase is required because who keeps records of rods that they've bought years before? All that we ask is that you complete a full list of all your tackle when you take out the policy, and there's no need to update the list during the year if you buy new bits, they'll still be covered. And finally, as an added incentive, Calder are going to give away £50 worth of essential bits and pieces for every policyholder. So those are the details of the new Calder cover. For more information and all our terms and conditions, check out the website that's appearing on the screen now. And for a quote, go to the website or call the number shown. We've got some brand new kit from Daiwa to show you here. First of all, the Regal BR reels. Got the bite and run facility on there. So as I pull that back, we've got free spool and then turn the handle and you've engaged the clutch on the reel. So the back bit there is to adjust the freeze ball and the front clutch, which is nice and smooth, is when the reel's actually fishing and you're playing a fish. This one is the Z. It's got six ball bearings, a nice sort of graphite gray color. Comes with a metal spare spool as well and comes in four sizes. This is the smallest one in the range of three and a half. There's a four, four, five and a 5,000 as well. And then the one down from it is the Regal X. That's a black colored reel. It's got three ball bearings rather than six. So it's a little bit more affordable. Comes in the same four sizes as well and comes with a spare spool as well. And if you're going to couple it with a rod like this Mission X, you've got a very balanced setup there. If you're not fishing big waters or you're just getting into your carp fishing, I can't recommend these strongly enough. Fantastic line lay, air bail, line clip on it as well, and twist buster. Loads of features on that for the money. If you're gonna fish small waters, they're the ones for you. And then this fella, we're all very, very excited about this one. This is ridiculously cheap for what you're getting. This is the new cross cast reel from Daiwa. That's the 5000, there's a 5.5 and a 5000 LD, which is long distance, so it's a much deeper spool on it. Beautiful styling on that reel, nice matte black finish to it. Great big line clip, if I turn that round, you've got a high impact line clip on it. Nice twist buster on there as well, really smooth clutch, and that looks lovely underneath one of these longbow DFs. I could quite happily sit behind these, and what you're getting for your money there is just incredible. When I think back to the days of old, and how much I used to pay for reels when I first started carp fishing, that now is just so affordable, and it's doing pretty much anything that a Bayesia is gonna do. All right, your cast is not gonna go quite as far. It's a little bit heavier, but for the styling and everything that you're getting for the money, they are an absolutely fantastic reel. Now, if you're like me and you do a number of overnighters, then check out this new system by Aqua. It's called the Fast and Light, and it's actually a scaled down version of their full Broly system, but it's still got a number of lovely features that just makes it brilliant for those short sessions. As for setting it up, it is exactly that, very light in weight and super fast to put up. It comes complete with its own nice zip case, so take it out of that. I put my bed chair nice and flat in the position that I want to fish in, and then open up the Broly. Take out the thread out of the center part, and then lock the ribs in place, and put that thread back in place so you don't lose it. Now, once it's all opened up, lay it down. This has got an extended four ribs that sit to the floor. So very, very important added coverage you get with that. The pegs that come with it are also very durable. They're not your normal cheapy ones that you see with other brollies, they're proper bits of kit. So peg them in, nice and sturdy, and then you come round to doing your actual storm poles. These don't come complete with a fast and light, however, they're an added extra that you can buy, but the storm pole connections do come with it. So all you've got to add to this is the storm poles. Put them in place, open them up. You can either take it out wider to bring the whole lot low, or have it like this, I've got it a nice height. So when I get inside, like I'm going to do now, you've got a nice bit of coverage. And what I like about this is it's got these sort of sides that come out, so it allows you to bring your bed chair further forward. You've got this rib here, so you don't get any beads of water all over your head. And then inside, you can put all your bags in that, round the back, so you can have this bed chair at the front, extra coverage, and I haven't got these ribs digging in my back. And as for the material, it's the Aquatex. What's wonderful about this is that the water just drips off it and you don't get the same level of condensation inside. So on those early mornings when you're laying there pondering why you've just blanked, you haven't got beads of water prodding you on the head, nothing worse than that. Just a wonderful brolly system, the Fast and Light by Aqua. I couldn't recommend it highly enough. 
Over the last 12 months, I've spent a lot of time on the bank with top matchmen, Alex Bones, Steve Ringer and Mick Ball, whilst we've been producing the new Fishing Gurus TV show. These guys have gone to a lot of commercial carp waters and taken the place to pieces on some of this new guru tackle. So if you've never seen it, I promise you it's got a place on the big carp fishing scene. So sit back, put your feet up and watch some of this. Getting the business end right is absolutely crucial to success. So Steve, run me through your rig right the way from the hook. Well, let's start with the hair rig itself. I'm a big believer when fishing the method and using hair rig baits. I mean, you get a better percentage of hooked fish to bite ratio, which is what you want. So, first of all, I take a length of 022 silk shock. 022 baits are sort of eight, nine pounds, you know, so it's, there's plenty of strength. That might, it might seem a little bit strange using four pound main line and then like an eight pound hook length. But what you've got to remember is you've got a long length of main line with plenty of stretch. Whereas with a hook length, it's a very short three to four inch length and you're getting a lot of pressure on of that course, small yeah. amount of mono. Yeah. So if anything's going to break, although it doesn't make sense, it's always the hook length. Okay, yeah. So take your 022 silk shot, tie a small overhand loop uh, in the end, then I trim off about 10 inches of line and then thread a small bit of silicon onto the line followed by the hook. My hook choice is always matched to the size of hook bait. Okay. So like today we're fishing uh, mini boilies, pellets, them sort of baits. So I'm using a size 14 QM1. Okay. You might notice they're a very unusual shape hook. Uh, they've got a very large offset and almost sort of a circle type shape. It's something that's very different in, in, between myself and yourself. You know, I mean, I know we were very keen to play around with different shapes. We always bent our own hooks looking for what we believe is the perfect hook pattern. Yeah. And I think with this QM1, you know, we were not far off. So that's 14 for mini boilies. Uh, fishing any smaller baits, six, drop down to a 16 for like a six mil pellet. And so, you've increased the hook size even for bigger baits as well, size 12 even? Yeah, if I'm using a 10 mil bait, size 12. You know, one little tip I will give, a lot of people make the mistake, say if you do get an odd hook pull, they automatically go up to a bigger hook, because I think that only accentuates the situation and makes it worse. So if you are suffering from an odd lost fish, which to be fair, you don't get very often with QMs, <laughs> you know, always drop down a hook size. Okay. And when you're giving a smaller hook, better presentation, more chance of that hook being, the bait being taken confidently. Yeah, great tip, okay. So anyway, we've got the overhand loop, a little bit of silicon on the line, and then we've threaded the hook on. The next job is to thread the silicon around the shank of the hook. You can just see it just sits just on the actual, past the top of the bend on the straight part of Almost the hook. trapping the hair in place. Yeah. All it does is, is lines everything up. Okay. Then all I've done is used a knotless knot uh, to tie the hook. I've put 10 turns on and then finished it off by coming back through the eye, always point side. I know it might seem quite sort of a basic tip, but the line should always exit the hook point side so you get that anti-eject effect. Right. Uh, then the actual length of the, the hook length itself, I've messed about a lot using different hook lengths. And I mean, a lot of people in the early days fished with hook length almost that short like inch, inch, inch and a half even. But the way I believe that sort of carp feed, as they've sort of wised up to the method, they come over the top of the feeder. If you imagine this is the fish's mouth and it sucks everything up. If you've only got an inch and a half hook length, you've got very little movement. So unless the fish is really almost troughing on top of your feeder, yeah, okay. you're not going to hook anything. The X shape to me offers superior grip as in for the pellets and ground bait when you're molding them on. So when you're casting, you haven't got to worry about everything flying off. But at the same time, once that feeder hits the bottom, that it allows quick release of the, of the contents. Yep. So you're getting a nice fast breakdown, meaning you can get bites within almost five seconds of the feeder hitting the bottom. In between the X shape, you've got the actual, what I call the bait platform, which literally like so, you can just rest your hook bait on. You can then put your pellets or ground bait straight over the top. And there's two ways you can mould with this feeder. You can say you can either use the platform as it's intended, or you can literally, literally just use the platform as a guide point. So you're getting the best of both worlds. But okay. That is what I believe to be the optimum position for your hook bait when method feeder fishing. One of the most impressive parts, I honestly believe, of this feeder is the way it casts. And the reason for this, it's got what a weight forward design. If you can just see, the bulk of the weight of the feeder is actually in the nose. This means when you're casting into even the stiffest of winds, the, feed, the feeder actually flies nice and straight and true. Yeah, okay. So you've got that weight forward design. The second benefit to that is, because the, the bulk of the weight is in actual nose, that's where your hook length is attached. So when a fish does pick up that hook bait and it goes to swim off, it's, it's hooking itself against... It's getting the full force. Yeah. yeah, so you're increasing the bolt effect, so you're going to get more fish, not I mean, more, 
the more bites actually hook themselves. Sometimes you get that sharp tap when it, you think, oh, the fish has got away with it. They're not going to get away with it with the bulk of the weight <laughs> at, the, at the nose of the feeder. So, that, you know, I mean, that's an important part and it does serve two very good purposes. Then you've got the stems. Uh, the big feeder, there's two feeders in the range. I think you've got them both there. They come with different size stems. The big feeder comes with a longer stem. The short feeder comes with, with a, a smaller stem. The stems are actually interchangeable between feeders. And what I'd say is, the further you want to cast, say if you want to cast 40, 50 yards, put the long stem in the feeder. And if you want to fish short range, put the short stem in the feeder. Okay. You know I mean? it's, the short stem's less obtrusive when you don't need the distance, but when you do need the distance, that stem, although it may be sort of only a couple of inches out top of the feeder, it makes a massive difference as in the terms of stability. When you're chucking the feeder, it stops through into a wind or even in a flat calm, it stops it wobbling and means it almost goes like a dart. You know, it's the same sort of effect. Nice long stem, helps the feeder cut through the wind and it flies nice and straight. Brilliant. Okay, and what about the colour? Uh, colour is something you know, both myself and you, you looked at long and hard. And we, we were originally of the opinion that sort of clear was always a good colour. We were, yeah. But then when we thought about it and we, you know, when we looked at some of the underwater footage that's been done in the past, Clear is actually a colour that almost stands out like a sore thumb. It's not a natural colour. So what we've gone for is sort of a, a darkish green colour that's going to blend in on pretty much any bottom. And the less of fish carp in particular in commercial see a lot of method feeders. So the less obtrusive we can make the feeder and the more it blends in, the less fish are going to spook away from it. Yeah. So that's the reasoning behind the actual colour. So what about playing fish, Steve? You always seem to keep the rod really low to the water. Yeah, playing fish is almost like it's a similar scenario to having a dog on a lead. If you try and pull a fish sort of directly upwards, so it's coming out of the water, it'll always pull harder against you. So okay. by keeping the rod nice and low, you can actually minimise the pressure on the fish. I see you're just switching sides there as well. As it runs to the left, you put the rod to the right. Yeah, you know, what I do like to do is, is try and avoid whatever possible change in the angle is too much. I mean, but, if you, because you can actually weaken the hook, then, the hook hold a little bit by constantly changing the angle. The most crucial thing is obviously you're always you're switching the angle to keep, keep a good bend in the rod, to let the rod work. Yeah, definitely. It, it, the key is to keep everything nice and smooth. I mean, if I can, I'll pump the fish in from, from distance, just at the, keeping the rod nice and low to the left, yep. so I don't have to change the angle at all. And then I'll only actually lift the rod when the fish is right under the rod top itself. What will tend to happen often then is you can sort of disorientate the fish, because all of a sudden there's a change of angle of pressure it'll come up to the top and sometimes you can, you can almost like mug it and net it before it's beaten, so to speak. Right. This is actually a tench, I think. But as, as you see, it's not actually working with this one. <laughs> but the secret is, if you do miss it the first time, you know, and take your time. So if you're in a match situation, I mean, you don't need a lot of fish. Often, if you break it down over five hours, you can afford to take your time with a fish. Yeah. So important to take your time and make sure you get it out. Here we go, it's a nice tent. There we go, that one's ready. Lovely job. Today we're at Manor Farm Leisure near Evesham and we're going to be fishing the island pool and I'm going to be discussing with Alex Bones a method that he actually regards as being more effective than the method feeder. To find out more, follow me. Well Alex, I've teased the viewers at home with a little bit of information about the tactics you're going to be demonstrating today. Just talk to me about what exactly you're doing and exactly how that feeder works. Well this secret tactic Steve is actually the pellet feeder. What it is is a small elasticated feeder designed for presenting small feed pellets. Right, it's very different in shape to a sort of standard opening feeder or even a method feeder. Yeah, what this actually allows you to do is to fish a hook bait tucked right inside the, inside the frame with small, small softened pellets. Okay, is that why you've got such a steep loading angle at the front of the feeder itself? Yeah, I mean where it differs to the method feeder is that it actually encapsulates the bait. Right. So it's ideal for sort of casting close to features and things like that. Right, so literally you're putting your hook bait right inside the feeder itself and then the pellets will just spill out and the fish can suck the whole lot. Yeah, up. the hook bait gets tucked inside the feeder along with everything else. Okay, let's talk about the actual feeder and the theory behind the actual design of it. Okay, well the, fir the first point is that we wanted a weight forward effect. Right. So I mean, the, you'll notice that these fly exceptionally well yeah. through the air. I mean, you can put these further than any other pellet feeder out there. Okay. So that's the first point worth touching on. There's, I mean, the two sizes, the smalls are 24 and the large right. are 28 grams. Take it, that's the 
That's the larger feeder? Yeah, that's the one. So obviously smaller weight for the smaller feeder, larger weight for the bigger feeder? That's correct, yeah. So moving on to the actual loading angle, we've, we've created quite a steep a shape there. Yeah. So basically fits the thumb, so you push a small amount of feed pellets in first, hook bait in, more feed pellets on top, okay. and it's just fitting the thumb. It's right. really easy to load. Okay, and the sort of veiny, sort of ribbed effect on the top, is that to sort of allow the water to access the pellets and help them break down? Yeah, right. basically, you want the pellets, once it's on the bottom, you want the pellets to tumble straight out with the hook bait, okay. and that's what that allows. The cross at the back as well okay. allows the water just to wash into the feeder. Right. I also noticed, for the size of feed, that's quite a long stem you're using today? Yeah, well, because these are interchangeable stems, I've opted for a longer version today. I'm mean, casting maybe sort of 40 to 45 yards right. and just want a bit more stability in flight. Okay. So whereas I would normally use a stem of this length for this feeder, I switched over just, just to help get that extra few yards. Right, it does make that big difference, does it? Definitely, I believe so, yeah. I mean, you can cast these an awful long way with this stem. Okay. Also, I noticed that stem's actually elasticated. Just talk me through how the elastic system works and the sort of benefits of playing fish on elastic. Yeah, okay. Well, wherever allowed, I would always opt for elastic over an inline setup. The elastic just allows more cushion under the rod right. tip. With short hook lengths, you get an awful lot of pressure exerted on that short length of mono, okay. which could otherwise lead to breakages. So when you're playing the fish in the elastic elastic stretching, that's taking up, all, you know, it's taking all the strain and all, all that shock out of right. the mono. So when a fish bumps its head, it just cushions that, that sort of effect on the, yeah. on the actual hook hold? Yeah, exactly. I mean, combined with soft rods, I mean, it's rare that you would lose many fish with this sort of setup. Welcome to episode two of Fishing Gurus, where I'm joined once again by top angler, Steve Ringer. We're back at the Aaron's Lake complex and we're sitting on the larger of the two pools today, which is stuffed full of carp. What we want to show you is two new cutting edge tactics. So once I've got this one in the net, I'll be popping around to Steve to get inside his mind. Steve, I notice there's no feeder on your rig today. Talk me through your approach. Well, I've got a very simple, what we call a straight lead approach. The way it works is as follows. I've got a little mini lead clip and then inside the lead clip, I've got a snap link swivel, which I'll deal with in a second. Then as you can see, I've got a little square lead. It's a two thirds of an ounce square pair. And attached to the snap link swivel, I've got a 12 inch mono hook link. That's about nine pound breaking strain. And I've got a size 12 QM1 hook, which is tied using the knotless knot. Instead of having your conventional loop at the end of the knotless knot, which you'd normally like for attaching boilies, I've got a little bait band, which I've just wrapped around that eight mil hard pellet. Yep, okay. So a nice simple setup. So what's the advantage of using a leg clip? Uh, the leg clip system's nice and simple, it's, it doesn't tangle, and also from a fish welfare issue, it's very safe. As in, if your main line does break, it just put, the snap link swivel can just pull out from the bottom of the leg clip, so it means the fish isn't going to be left tethered. Okay. So it works quite differently to what the carp leg clips do, in, as in which they're, they're designed to discharge the lead. This isn't designed to discharge the lead, it's designed, from a fish welfare point of view, to stop the fish trailing the lead about. Okay, so you're getting all the effects of the bolt, but it's safe at the same time. Yes, very much. Okay, what about your feeding today? So you've got an array of pellets on your side tray here. Yeah, I'm fishing a method that's recently come about in the last two years called the pellet cone. It basically involves a little plastic cone like so, taking some of these three mil wetted pellets, compressing them inside the cone. You can compress them as hard as you like, like so, and then taking a little needle, it's like basically like a little baiting needle with a hook latch on it. Okay passing that through. So going through the thick end first, out through the thin yeah, end? Yeah, which I'll, you know, that might seem the wrong way to do it, but I'll explain my reasoning behind that in a second. And take in a hook length, I've got a few made up here. We've got the loop, which attached to the snap link swivel. So now I've got my little hook on the end of my needle. Mm -hmm. Pass the need needle into the loop, pull it back through. And your hook bait's already attached to your rig yeah. there? Yeah, I'm gonna pull the hook bait right up into the bottom of the cone. And then it's just a case pushing the cone out, like so, and you've got it completed cone, ready to be cast out. The idea, obviously, is that hits the bottom, those micro pellets break down, and you've got a big pile of micro pellets right on top of your hook bait. 
You know, I mean, straight lead is a really effective way of fishing, but when you add the cone to it, you're really taking it to a whole new level. Well, what a fantastic day's fishing. We've both had a net full of fish each, and I've certainly thoroughly enjoyed my day. Yeah, there's been nothing really to choose between the PVA and the cone today. We've both had virtually a bite of chuck, and sport doesn't get much better than that. Well, before we slip these two back, there's one more point to conclude. Well, I have to be honest and think, although I've probably caught more in numbers, <laughs> you, I think you've just done me on the big fish front. So shall we call it a draw? Well, if that makes you feel better, I'll settle for that. Hope you've learned plenty. Thanks for watching. Now the rig I've decided to start approaching Gigantica with this year is a slight modification on a rig that I used back in England. It's a combination of the IQ fluorocarbon joined to the supernatural braid that we do. Let's talk about how I set it up first. At the hook bait end, you'll see it's typical muzzer style. I've drilled three quarters of the way through the 20 mil cell boilie and I've just plugged in a little cork insert. But as it's only drilled three quarters of the way through, you'll have a little bit protruding out the bottom, hence the word muzzer, abbreviation for mushroom. Now, I slide that onto a hair, which is made up of supernatural braid. I'm using the 18 pound here, because I don't think I need the 25 pound stepped up version that some of you guys in Europe might use. I'm fishing open water, that's ideal for the job. Now, to commence tying the knotless knot, what I've actually got, I've got one of the new captor hooks there, that's a size six wide gate in the gravel brown. I've got the little hat on top, just to protect that ultra sharp point at all times. The only time that'll come off is when I'm about to cast out. But don't forget to take it off. Um, to tie the knot, I'll go two times above the hair and then five times below. That traps it in place, typically like a KD rig. The next job is to cut off three quarters of an inch of 1.6 millimetre shrink tube. That's the, uh, the clay coloured one. And what I've done there is I've actually steamed it just a natural curve. Rather than an acute angle which closes down the gape, I like a nice progression. And as you'll see, with that position, it could sort of lock just around the bottom lobe. What I'm trying to do is get, get the, the bit of shrink tube just to hold it in place. If I could just show you that again, just on my finger. Imagine that's the bottom lobe of a fish. That hook's in place and that shrink tube is just grabbing. The next part of the job is to attach it to the IQ fluorocarbon. So I make a loop at the end of the fluorocarbon. I commence tying something called an Albright knot. It's actually not that difficult to tie. What you do is you thread the braid through that loop and then go seven times around the outside of it and then pass the tag end exactly the same way through where the braid came through the first time. And then just gently pull the knot down nice and easily. Caress it down, don't pull it down suddenly, that'll bunch the knot up and it won't make it as good and definitely not as strong. And then over the top, just to neaten it up, I use a little bit of rig putty, just a small mouse drop in size, just tidies everything up, makes it look that little bit smarter. And moving down to the lead end, I've got a hybrid leg clip system here. That's on the safe zone leader. It's one of the clear ones that comes complete with a hybrid leg clip. I've just tied the hook link with a five turn grid and knot to the ring swivel. And the reason I've chosen the hybrid leg clip on this setup is because I'm fishing, I'm not using a solid bag or anything like that. That's going in on its own. And that swivel lead's just gonna give me a bit of pivot. So that stiffer hook link will always rest on top of any sort of detritus or silt on the bottom. It won't be poking up, it'll be sitting flush to the bottom and hopefully those wily Gigantica carp might find that a little bit too good to resist. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's happened again. We're gonna finish the DVD with an absolute monster. Not mine this time, Mr. Hamid's. And I have to say, after a nightmare week for him, he's had two snag him up, Another one fall off, he's really made it count when it really mattered, and that is a real big one in there. But before that, I'd like to say thank you to all the guys who've been on the DVD. The information they've given has been absolutely tip top, and I'm sure it'll put a lot more fish on the bank for you. And also thank you to those manufacturers, because without them, the DVD would not be possible. So uh, I'm going to hand you over to the grinning man down there, and he's going to show you a beast. Well, I'd also like to extend my thanks to my boily stop for hanging in there so hard all week. That braided needle, without you, I just would never have caught this. Those captor hooks for laying there aimlessly days on end, just waiting to be sucked up. And those cell boilies and that new Grange. Mr Knight, you've done it again, son. Right, without further ado, let's have a look at this beast.
Well, here it is, a fish called single scale at 70 pounds, eight ounces. It smashed my PB by 15 pounds, one of the A-team of Gigantica. What a way to finish a DVD, come on!